Let me start our defense procedure. And uh, we have today the defense of Stepan Barashev uh, on the topic of photon correlations of optically trapped polariton condensates. But before passing the word to Stepan, let me shortly introduce the procedure of today and the jury members. The procedure it is uh, first uh, I introduce the jury members, then uh, Stepan will have 40 minutes for the talk, followed by our questions and answers from jury members. And I kindly ask to retain from long discussions. Let's try to do it more quick. Then the questions for the general audience. After that, word of the supervisor, then we'll take decision and announce it. It is a short procedure explanation. And now let me briefly describe the jury members. Uh, um, it is my great honor to be a chair of this committee, and we have two uh, prominent guest professors from uh, uh, Daniel Sanvita from CNRS Nanotech. Can you show? Yes, please. Daniel is a great specialist in polyaritonics and different nonlinear effects. And uh, next, our jury member is Professor Simone Liberata from the School of Physics and Astronomy in UK. He is also very well known for his works in the field of polyaritonics, nonlinear physics. Then let me switch to our sculptor team, represented by Professor Dmitry Gorin, who is a great specialist in biophotonics and application of optics in the medicine. And Professor Sekularis Miles, who is a great expert in the field of modification of solid states by means of laser physics. And finally, let me introduce shortly the supervisor of uh, the thesis, Professor Lubudakis, who is well-known specialist in the domain of polyaritonics, and now he more will pre present our photonic branch in Skoltek. And the su co-supervisor is Anton Zasidatilev, who I think contributed a lot to this work. And finally, let me pass the word to Stepan Barashev, who is the main hero of our day. Stepan, you have 40 minutes for your presentations. You're welcome. Uh, good day, everyone, uh, dear jury members. My name is Barashev Stepan, and uh, I'm here to present my uh, PhD thesis, PhD work, uh, mainly focused on the topic of uh, photon correlations of optically trapped polariton condensate. Um, uh, here is the outline of my talk, so I will be, uh, be, be giving a brief introduction into the matter by uh, discussing the uh, research objectives that we had uh, going into this to, through my PhD and uh, methods that were implemented uh, through the course of my PhD to measure all the uh, research data that I obtained. Then I will cover uh, briefly my results uh, when investigating the linear carbon chain uh, emission spectrum and decay times. Then I will uh, move forward to discuss uh, uh, polaritons which are created in uh, inorganic high quality micro cavities. Uh, uh, then uh, results and physics that we discovered during our experiments based on the Hanbury brown and twist interferometry which uh, described photon statistics of the light emitted from the polyton uh, condensate and uh, following uh, further into the photon statistical field uh, we will discuss the hongo mandel effect of uh, light emitted from polariton condensates and i will conclude with some uh, summary of my uh, achievements and some physics that I saw. So the problem statement, um, during my PhD I was fortunate enough to investigate a very novel uh, material which is uh, uh, linear carbon chains and I was one to basically optically characterize it. Uh, I observed uh, optic uh, spectrum, uh, spectral properties of such material and some uh, temporal characteristics such as decay times of excitons within these systems. Um, I also uh, investigated the polariton condensate second order coherence function in the sense of uh, minimized with, the, with minimized decoherence effect from the reservoir uh, from which uh, polaritons are created and in the absence of any transient dynam dynamic by implementing continuous wave excitation. 
uh, the investigation of optically confined polariton condensates actually led to an interesting observation of uh, uh, some particular polarization dynamic with this with, with this system, which we will discuss uh, later. And also, uh, I've looked into the indistinguishability properties of the polariton condensate emitting photons. The methods that were implemented to investigate all these things uh, are a time correlated single photon counting technique, which is commonly used to measure decay curves. Um, uh, non-resonant uh, excitation of polariton condensates with optical trap in the form of a ring, um, real uh, space, momentum space, and energy uh, spectrum, energy momentum dispersion imaging to characterize the uh, polariton condensate. Then uh, Stokes polarimetry, which uh, was detrimental to investigate the polarization characteristics of uh, polariton condensate. And uh, of course, humbry brown and Twiss interferometry to, to uh, study the second order, order correlation function, second order coherence function, and uh, hongo mandel uh, interferometry to study the degree of photon indistinguishability in the system. So uh, let me move on uh, and here I would like to uh, discuss these uh, very interesting uh, results that we've, get, we've got. So before, um, uh, in, the, in the start of my PhD, I was fortunate to work in the collaboration with a big group of scientists who actually uh, managed to synthesize uh, uh, this um, uh, novel uh, material of carbon uh, monochains. And uh, uh, from a, a variety of the samples that I have studied, uh, we find found out very interesting uh, spectral characteristics of such thing, uh, such uh, materials, um, namely uh, very distinct uh, uh, spectral lines, which are uh, attributed to each individual uh, chain with specific lengths. Also. Uh, 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 which is basically due to a uh, transition of uh, uh, of uh, electron through the band gap of uh, from the highest orbital molecular orbit highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital also we saw that the uh, energy is very dependent on the chain lengths and additionally at cryogenic at cryogenic temperatures we observed a um, a specific uh, fine structural structural uh, splitting, uh, not structural, but spectral splitting uh, in this uh, spectrum, which we are attributed to uh, appearance of uh, some uh, trions, uh, trions uh, within the system due to uh, implementation of these uh, gold nanoparticles within the system. The uh, decay curves which were obtained uh, with spectral filtering um, revealed uh, different uh, decay times uh, for each individual chain length. And uh, uh, if you look at the uh, difference of the decay curves uh, for a room temperature, when we investigated it in a room temperature and in the four uh, Kelvin cryogenic temperatures, you can see that the shape of the decay curves are different and the difference is attributed to uh, non-radiative uh, re relaxation channels within the system, which are uh, basically thermal hopping of the uh, carriers uh, between the uh, carbon chains, which are located very close to each other. Uh, continuing on to main topic of my research is uh, investigation of polaritons and their characteristics in uh, the semiconductor micro cavities. And my colleague Anton previously gave quite a sophisticated um, introduction into the matter. Uh, I would like to say once again to uh, repeat that the polaritons are two, not, uh, polaritons are a new eigenstate within the system uh, in which strong coupling is achieved. And uh, uh, when you have a, a, a layer uh, of excitons, uh, basically, basically where excitons are hosted within the micro cavity in a tight confinement, uh, um, uh, light couples to the to the excitons and two new uh, eigenstates within the system appear, which is upper polaritons, lower polaritons. And uh, these polaritons are new quasi-particles which are uh, 
very nice in the sense that um, they have goods and bads of uh, uh, of uh, light and matter, although the goods are uh, overweighing the bads in the systems, and you can do very uh, a lot of interesting uh, things with them. Uh, and also, these um, polariton polaritons. Uh, can form a, a macroscopically occupied coherent state uh, within the system, which we call uh, polariton condensates. Now, I would like to uh, say a couple of words about uh, uh, intensity interferometer and how, the way how we obtain the second order cor uh, correlation function, second order uh, coherence function. So. Um, it was devised by Humphrey Brown and Twiz, uh, and actually uh, for some uh, um, uh, to study uh, some cosmic uh, um, uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, it is a very simple scheme uh, which contains two detectors uh, and a beam splitter, which allows a, a stream of photons. Uh, through or uh, reflected, and depending on the photon statistics of such uh, of a photon stream of a light source which creates the stream, uh, you get a different kind of correlation functions. For example, for coherent light source, uh, which is laser, for example, you can have a, a correlation function basically independent uh, on the detection times between. Uh, uh, the delay time between the detectors click. However, for example, if you have a slight source which has some uh, super Poissonian statistics, uh, such as a uh, uh, super Poissonian statistics, sorry, such as, for example, single uh, photon emitters, uh, you would have only, uh, uh, in general, uh, only single photon in uh, one or another mode at a given time. Thus, uh, two detectors will not click. Uh, simultaneously, because they trigger when the detec detection event is happening, and in the correlation function, you would see that uh, in zero time delay, you have no uh, simultaneous clicks between these two detectors, and thus you will have uh, this kind of in the middle panel here, so, uh, above Poissonian statistics, where is written, you will have this kind of dip uh, in the correlation function value. Now, if your uh, photons are uh, traveling in bunches, uh, this is a characteristic of somewhat a thermal light source, which emits uh, photon in bunches. Uh, you would have a correlation function that have a peak or uh, some uh, increased value at this zero time delay. Now, uh, the polaritons are not uh, exactly new, so a lot of people actually did study uh, the second order coherence of uh, the polaritons and the polariton emission in variety of the regimes. And actually, uh, because this is a quite an important uh, characteristic of a light source, um, and there are a lot of uh, already research done in this field, uh, people obtained. Um, significant amount of results in the different uh, regimes of, of generation, generating the polariton condenses. However, uh, while reading the literature, uh, it was noticed that um, the regime in which polariton condensates, in my, my opinion, are created uh, somewhat in a pure uh, state uh, uh, were missing. And by pure state, I mean uh, that uh, there, were, there were no um, overlap of the reservoir with, um, or minimized res uh, overlap of the reservoir from which uh, polaritons are created with the place from which the emission is gathered. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, many of the results we are do uh, dealing with the uh, pulsed excitation regime in which uh, you have some transient dynamic of the polaritons which uh, have some uh, basically decay uh, contribution from which will also go into the measurement scheme and will contribute to overall general photon statistics. So uh, in our laboratory to study the uh, coherence, the second order coherence property of the condensate, we devised a setup which allowed us to actually <coughs> capture the polariton condensate within an optical trap, uh, 
minimizing the overlap with the reservoir and doing this in the continuous wave uh, excitation regime. And on the left here, you can see a, a, a schematic of the, uh, of the setup we used uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the hologram which we apply to the SLM, uh, which is special light modulator, which basically modifies our excitation beam uh, to have some uh, uh, particular uh, pump profile, which is a ring in our case. And with this ring, we excite our sample and uh, get the polaritons uh, in the middle of the trap. On the left, uh, in panel D, you can see how the dispersion curve looks like below condensation threshold and above condensation threshold. And in uh, panels F and E, you can see how the K-space of such condensate and the real space of such condensate looks like. Next to it is our uh, schematic of the microcavity, which has uh, substrate and uh, sets of the DBRs, bottom DBRs and top DBRs with quantum wells embedded in it. And on right to it is schematic of our excitation beam profile and uh, um, uh, condensate where it emerges uh, from the middle of the trap. <laughs> I want to point out that we excite our condensate uh, non-resonantly and the excitation wavelengths uh, is set up so that it is um, most um, efficient to uh, to couple uh, to, to get into the cavity in the first break minimum and the condensate emergent uh, is uh, uh, offset from that excitation wavelengths and uh, the wavelengths that we use and what we which we record is uh, written, written in the slide now the uh, polarization of condensate emission can be uh, usefully mapped onto the uh, Poincaré sphere with the use of so-called uh, Stokes parameters. Sorry, uh, Stokes parameters, and uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the, uh, uh, during our research, we have uh, actually uh, the main uh, investigator for this was my colleague. However, we were doing uh, this uh, together and uh, in parallel with what I did for investigating the photon statistics. Uh, the polarimeter was devised, Stokes polarimeter was devised, who, which was able to basically detect the uh, orientation and the and the length of the Stokes vector, uh, which uh, characterized the emission of the polariton condensate. And if you look at the, uh, at the maps of the polarization, which are presented here, you can see that the polariton condensate actually exhibits uh, quite uh, a set of uh, interesting re regimes uh, 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 dependent on the excitation pump power and excitation polarization. And in these regimes, uh, in the parallel, we actually observed uh, different photon statistics. So let me move on to the Hanbury Brown and recent experiments that I've done. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, setups that were devised. On the left, you can see a simple setup with its beam splitter and two detectors, as uh, I was presenting before. It was used to record the photon statistics of the condensate as it is. Uh, and on the right, it is a little bit more complicated setup. However, it, 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 in general, it is the same. Uh, on the right, we uh, basically separate uh, and uh, projection, polarization projections uh, onto each individual uh, HBT interferometer and also measure the cross correlation between the uh, polarization projections. So correlator one, for example, will use, uh, will measure uh, circularly polarized light in one direction and correlator two will uh, detect uh, circular polarized light in the other direction and correl correlator three will uh, uh, access the cross correlation between these two directions. And by using set of uh, polarization optics, it is uh, trivial to gain access to other uh, polarization uh, projections in the scheme. Now, um, to the results that we gained uh, were very uh, interesting in the sense that uh, 
as we expected, and I'm not presenting the, this here thoroughly, but I want to say that uh, the condensate uh, photon statistics as it is, that was measured in the simpler part of the setup, uh, 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 was um, as if uh, uh, after reaching uh, uh, condensation threshold, the photon statistics um, showed some very little photon bunching, and then when we uh, increased the, the uh, excitation power above condensation threshold, and you can see in the panel A here, it is 1.31p threshold, the uh, correlation function which we obtained uh, had no features in the zero time delay, and uh, as if uh, our condensate uh, projects uh, emits a coherent light. However, uh, and I assure you that if we even more increase the excitation pump power to some reasonable value, it will still re remain uh, in the same uh, coherent, uh, coherent uh, correlation functions. However, uh, if we now take this same light, which appears to be coherent, uh, and its correlation function is close to uh, one, um, and project uh, onto the different polarization projections, we will see that for different polarization components, uh, the photon statistics are very much different. And here, for example, uh, you can see that uh, photon statistics uh, and correlation function measured for uh, horizontally, vertically polarized light, diagonally, anti-diagonally polarized light uh, looks like uh, uh, very different and the cross correlation between them shows up as if there is some anti-bunching within the system. However, this anti-bunching can be represented as uh, some spontaneous switching between the polarization. So in the sense, in the classical sense, that when the photons are uh, present in one, uh, uh, one side of the correlator, they are absent in the other side of the correlator, and thus in the cross-correlation we will get this kind of dip here. Uh, it is reasonable to ask uh, how this compared to the single-mode laser, and uh, the, 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 the answer is, uh, uh, well, uh, the answer is uh, that uh, however you divide and project the emission from the single mode laser, which is also coherent, uh, uh, however you divide it and project on different polarization bases, the uh, photon statistics for these polarizations remain coherent, remain the same, remain, remain the, the correlation function remains as a plateau. However, as you can see here in this picture, uh, uh, the condensate photon statistics uh, although it appears to be coherent, if you count it uh, uh, without any polarization separation, uh, its projections look very much different, with a very high photon bunching in some directions. Now, um, uh, on, on what, uh, the question is on what uh, this dependence is well, how, 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 it, how it is dependent. So we uh, did an investigation of the, uh, this uh, second order co correlation function, density correlation function amplitude on the excitation pump power. And notice that uh, there are actually regimes in which uh, we can reach and see how um, the photon statistics uh, di di differs uh, with, the, with respect to the excitation pump power. And with this, uh, we can say that we can actually tune the photon statistics uh, emitted in one or the other excitation component and basically um, uh, control the amplitude of the photon bunching. And uh, uh, the explanation that we uh, uh, got is um, uh, uh, there is some uh, biofringence in the cavity which actually dictates in which uh, polarization direction the condensation will occur predominantly. And uh, this is basically the parameter which pins the polarization to some direction and for that pinned polarization component the emission is significant, getting significantly more gain in the system. And thus it is very intense and any uh, noise which can be present in the system affects it uh, very, uh, in, in very little amount. Uh, 
on the contrary, the direction, which is opposite to the pinned one, uh, is very uh, faint. And thus, the, uh, the, the noise which is present into the system, which is connected to the noise for the opposite direction, affects this very faint mode uh, strongly, thus giving us very high uh, photon bunchings for the system. And uh, yes, and uh, I should say that this uh, birefringent, which is present in the system, of course, uh, uh, can be uh, modeled and explained as some uh, uh, effective magnetic field which splits the energy levels within the system. And uh, in this case of birefringent, this uh, effective magnetic field is oriented in the plane of the cavity. And you can see here, it's basically oriented within the equatorial plane of the Poincaré sphere, this S1 and S2 uh, component representing the axis. Now, um, I showed you before the uh, polarization maps that we had, uh, which were obtained by using the Stokes polarimeter. And uh, we run uh, uh, basically uh, the experiments simultaneously for these integrated measurements on Stokes polarimeter and these time resolved uh, second order coherence measurements. And we noticed that basically there is a one-to-one -to -one correspondence with what we see on the Stokes polarimeter and on the uh, uh, Correlation, uh, correlation function that we obtain. So you can see here that uh, when um, the uh, S1 component, which is represented by green uh, uh, triangles, starts to uh, go down to almost minus one, uh, indicating that there is a predominant uh, vertical component coming through, the uh, correlation function for the vertical component starts to, the uh, amplitude of the correlation function starts to approach one as well. And um, vice versa, the, uh, the correlation function amplitude for the horizontal component starts to shoot up, indicating the high values of the photon bunching. And this is the same uh, thing that dictates uh, the degree of polarization in the system. Now on the panel C, uh, uh, you can see uh, some uh, example of um, of um, uh, time series that we get and highlighted in the green areas, you can see some correlated um, spikes, intensity spikes for black, it is a horizontally polarized light, for uh, red, it is vertically polarized light. And you can see that there is some correlated spikes, which is basically uh, switching of the mode spontaneously, the switching of the mode, which uh, also in, uh, influences the correlation functions. Now, um, uh, the, uh, the birefringence of the cavity is something that we cannot control. This is something uh, that is coming due to uh, some structural strain, mechanical strain within the system. However, we have shown that uh, uh, we can also engineer this photon statistics and the amplitude of the photon bunching by just uh, modulating the excitation profile. So when we uh, elongate it in one way or the other, we break this symmetry uh, within the system and uh, we can uh, make one of the polarization components be more dominant than the other. Also, uh, uh, interesting observation was done uh, by slightly changing the excitation of the laser, the polarization of the um, of the uh, of, of the laser, making it slightly elliptical. And when we made it slightly elliptical, although uh, as experiment uh, as it is in experiment, it is actually uh, more difficult to make uh, excitation polarization. Purely, purely linear than have some small ellipticity within the system. So uh, we've first seen this, but when the excitation ellipticity is slightly, uh, slightly elliptical, you can see that the amplitude of the correlation function, which is basically made, uh, make up this uh, map here. Uh, if you take a profile at zero time delay, you can see that uh, the amplitude of the correlation function also differs. But also there are emergent of this rippling, which is happening periodically. And for this, um, the, next, the next slide probably is more representative. Um, uh, for this rippling, uh, it can be explained as uh, 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 
and another uh, uh, magnetic field, effective magnetic field, uh, emerging from the system. And why it is happening is due to we by uh, applying some ellipticity into our beam, we start to uh, excite our polariton reservoirs uh, out of balance. And we, when we do it in a, uh, out of balance, we gain we give more gain to one more uh, more than the other, and there is uh, uh, there is uh, kind of pop population uh, oscillation starts to happen. And this population oscillation will uh, present itself as uh, intensity uh, correlation function oscillations and actually a uh, precession of overall uh, Stokes vector of polariton emission around an effective magnetic field which is composed from this uh, in, plane, in, plane, in plane magnetic field uh, and uh, out of plane magnetic field, in plane magnetic field which comes from the biofringence and out of plane magnetic field which comes from the disbalance between the reservoirs um, yes and uh, as another interesting point that you probably can see from this uh, picture here is that the bunching that we can obtain with the purely uh, linearly polarized excitation which is represented by epsilon zero here is actually reaching up to the values uh, um, higher than the thermal limit which is two and we can have a photon bunching uh, more than two uh, and the decay of this uh, correlation function uh, appear to be uh, very long it's like it's uh, reaching to the 10 nanosecond here uh, which is um, uh, very long if you compare to any characteristic time on our system which is uh, coherence time of nanosecond and uh, maybe uh, lifetimes of polaritons, which is uh, tens of picoseconds. Now, um, if you take a look at the and at the examples uh, that is, are shown here on the left, you can see that the horizontal and vertical polarization components are actually processing uh, with the same, uh, the, the, the correlation function has the same amplitude and its cross correlation components shows up as if it is inverted, indicating that there is actual uh, a rotation of the Stokes vector, which when projected on, uh, on the, some axis in which we take the, our measurement uh, shows up as um, basically oscillation of the number of photons coming into the system and the cross correlation here indicates that uh, when the photons in one arm of the uh, interferometer the photons are absent from in the other arm of the interferometer and we actually uh, managed to measure the this precession frequency basically we correlated the precession frequency uh, with the energy splitting that we could measure with the uh, uh, etalon um, um, with, the, with, with, with the very high precision wave meter uh, and uh, it corresponds to the energy splitting between uh, uh, the light which is emitted in, in the circularly polarized in one direction and the other direction for the given uh, excitation, excitation uh, laser uh, polarization ellipticity. Now uh, with a lot of uh, uh, with a lot of different regimes Within, uh, which generate uh, interesting photon statistics, we uh, try to look further into the, um, uh, the matter of photon statistics and we try to uh, look into the uh, so-called indist uh, photon indistinguishability parameter or for our system. And uh, let me uh, briefly explain it to you. It is some uh, interesting phenomenon that was uh, qu quite recently observed um, experimentally and predicted uh, theoretically, which basically uh, indicates that if you have uh, if you have a, a set of photons, uh, uh, one photon entering from each side of the beam splitter simultaneously you can imagine that there is like four patterns how they can leave. However, if these, if these uh, photons have uh, uh, the same characteristics here, uh, I've given the example of uh, polarization, but if, you, if these photons have the same characteristics, only two patterns 
how they emerge uh, remain. And this was shown for the um, sets of uh, two, photon, two photons, which were generated by parametric uh, down conversion and uh, the uh, light sources listed here. And they were uh, showing the, this effect of Hongo Mandel, uh, which basically all the time the two photons were exiting from uh, one end of the beam splitter. However, this uh, effect is also represented if you use uh, a classical light source. You don't need a, a, a two-photon generator. Um, and uh, for these light sources, for the lasers, uh, the experiments were run and they showed that the hongo mandel effect have a, a correlation function with the deep visibility of 50%. So the deep reaches only to half of the uh, value. And these experiments were run with two uncoupled lasers uh, and one laser, but the fact is that the photons should be, should share a characteristic, they should be indistinguishable. Now, uh, in our system, uh, we see that the polariton condensate have a very interesting um, uh, interesting characteristics resembling the laser. However, it, its polarization uh, remains, uh, b basically it, it, it still um, give us hard time answering some questions. For example, uh, if we excite the uh, condensate with purely circularly polarized excitation, the condensate tend to uh, tend to shine in co-circularly polarized light. However, uh, if you excite it with linearly polarized light, we have a whole uh, bunch of interesting phenomena which I described before. Um, and for example, here you can see that the degree of polarization, the DOP here, is approaching to zero, indicating that uh, although the condensate is all, already above condensation threshold, its uh, degree of polarization is close to zero. And basically two uh, questions were, were uh, reason um, how uh, condensate uh, photon indistinguishability is different from what you can have for a single mode laser. And for that, we can uh, prepare condensate with circularly polarized light above threshold, above, uh, above threshold where uh, it emits as if it is close to laser. Uh, and the other question is, what is happening exactly in this uh, unpolarized above threshold emitting regime, whether it is a, a polarization which uh, switches spontaneously and very rapidly so that we cannot detect any oscillation or any cross correlation um, between them, or um, is the condensate is tru truly um, unpolarized basically with some parts of it emitting some linearly polarized light oriented randomly. And for that, uh, the Hongo Mandel uh, interferometer was de uh, devised, and this um, interferometer was uh, designed to uh, help us to answer these questions. Uh, let me explain briefly. So we have a condensate entering our uh, scheme separated into the two paths, which one, uh, one of which uh, can be uh, delayed to respect to the other, and the other just straightly goes through. The condensate emission is prepared in the uh, same energy with the same polarization by introducing polarizers into the system. The sp uh, spatial, spatial uh, from the time uh, spatial matching was done by introducing a single mode fiber uh, here. And the polarization matching was done by using uh, additional uh, polarization optics to compensate any polarization, which uh, polarization shift, polarization change, which can happen within the fiber before the photons basically meet on this beam splitter here. Um, and with this device, of course, it is uh, reasonable to first check whether it will give you the same uh, characteristic as people already had from the lasers. And indeed, we run this experiment. We use two lasers. Uh, 
and uh, put them into this interferometer and saw that indeed the correlation function between them has a deep uh, with the visibility of almost 0 0.5 and uh, on this panel in the middle here you can see there is some oscillations but this is like technical uh, issue due to uh, laser uh, energy offsetting from each other uh, through the measurement um, and uh, if you look at this panel B here, you can see that it is the basically dependence of the deep visibility of this Hongo Mandel effect with respect to uh, the polarization between the uh, uh, between the arms of this interferometer. And by tuning the polarization, making it parallel or orthogonal to each other, we can tune the visibility uh, from basically zero percent to uh, 40 percent let's say uh, in, in our opinion this demonstration was good enough to perceive, proceed and work with the condensate now because it basically almost achieved the uh, the results that we that people achieved with the lasers and we tried our best to measure the hongo mandel effect of the uh, of the condensate as said before, prepared with circularly polarized light above threshold. And what we saw was uh, sort of surprising to us because we didn't observe the, uh, the uh, excitation, uh, the, the Hongo Mandel dip uh, when the two arms of the interferometer were uh, exactly in the same, um, at the same length so basically when the optical time delay between the two arms is zero but rather when we shift the optical delay uh, time and move out of the coherence time of this condensate we start to see the dip and uh, although we move out of this um, of this uh, uh, coherence time and start to see the dip the dip visibility remains uh, uh, very small if we compare to what we have for the laser. So if on the right you can see the comparison between the result we get from the laser, the blue line, and what we get from the condensate. This is one thing that we noted. Uh, and uh, here um, let me um, briefly go through. This is the uh, exact same measurement but uh, if we look at uh, the condensates created in the traps uh, with different uh, sizes. So here, uh, the, as size gets more tighter, uh, the deep becomes more far, uh, basically Hongo Mandel di dynamics, the dynamic of this beat, uh, of this deep becomes more faster as well. Uh, and what also we noted is that uh, if we look at the Hongo Mandel effect, uh, when we excite our uh, condensate with linear polarized light, obtaining uh, with linear polarized light with, with very high um, excitation, uh, with very low excitation electricity, I should say, uh, we noted that the uh, the effect of the Hongo Mandel effect, which is represented here in the red, the the correlation function that we obtain in the Hongo Mandel. Um, uh, uh, Hongo Mandel uh, um, composition of the setup um, is drastically bigger uh, from what we had when we studied the, uh, the polarization condensate pre created with circularly polarized light. So with circularly polarized light the effect on the correlation function was just uh, 15% here we see that the amplitude of the uh, correlation function drops drops down dramas dramatically uh, and as additional uh, interesting feature that we've noticed is uh, the uh, uh, the following so when we pre create a, a condensate in this precession regime so when this the polarization uh, vector of the condensate starts processing around some uh, effective magnetic field, uh, we can uh, actually uh, also uh, measure the precession frequency through the use of uh, Hongo Mandel effect. Uh, although the, um, the uh, time resolution 
uh, of our uh, HPT setup already not allowing us to uh, measure such a, such a, a precession frequencies. Uh, what I mean is that here on the left or on the right, this is better to say it on the right probably, you can see that there is some rippling in the map of the Hongo Mandel effect. And it is truly due to the photon statistics is being affected by the rotation of the, uh, of the uh, polarization of the condensate. However, if we increase the excitation ellipticity and make this precession become faster by introducing more imbalance in the system, at some point, uh, our TCSPC or Hongo Mandel electronics and setup cannot, ma uh, cannot uh, measure these oscillations. And uh, these oscillations become like a plateau. We cannot resolve them. However, due to this precession, precessing condensate is passing uh, through different uh, two different arms of the Hongo Mandel interferometer, and we delaying uh, one with respect to the other with the optical delay line, we still can resolve the precession frequency by appearance and disappearance of the Hongo Mandel effect, which is observed in this panel C here. Uh, at these uh, oscillation frequencies, we already cannot see any um, oscillations in the HBT, but on, in the Hongo Mandel, we still can see them. And uh, I would like to conclude here. So this is the wall of text, but basically what we have uh, during my PhD, what, ha what, what I have done is I've uh, had a chance to investigate the scarbins, very interesting structures, uh, measure the optical, spectral characteristic, temporal characteristics. Uh, so, so first time, very this fine uh, splitting in the optical spectrum. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, investigated the coherence uh, in the intensity, intensity correlation function of the condensate in optical trap uh, in the pure, pure regime. Uh, we have studied the, uh, spin, uh, the dynamics of the uh, polarization of the condensate and uh, showed the, the very high values of the photon bunching within the system and uh, the precession of the uh, polarization within the system and very long uh, correlation times within the system. And also, uh, I believe nobody investigated the Hongo Mandel effect uh, within the systems before. And uh, we also showed uh, uh, interesting and um, promising uh, results and data on which, uh, if I refer to the Hongo Mandel effect, the uh, uh, publications are in preparation currently. Thank you. Uh, and here are the publication lists that I got through my PhD. Stepan, thank you very much for very Any interesting questions? and good presentations. Now let's switch to the questions from the jury and I propose the first round of, of the questions, 10 minutes slot for each member of the jury and then if there will be other questions, we can make a second round, okay? So please, and let's start this time with Daniel. Daniel, 10 minutes section. Okay, thanks. Simone. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the talk has been nice and very complete and the thesis, I like it a lot. I like all this um, interesting um, uh, effect in a classical way. So this uh, quantum effect like Ongo Mendel, but seen in, uh, in a classical Poissonian uh, statistic uh, of photons. Okay, so let, let, let me start from the end, given that uh, also, well, so my, 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 my question, let's say, is about the Zongu Mendel, which I was very interested and curious about. Okay, so um, okay, let's start from the laser. The, uh, I think it was, okay, this, 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 this slide, sure. Okay, so, okay, first of all, from what I understand, so from, from the right side, you are changing the polarization between the two lasers. So when they are completely orthogonal, you shouldn't see any, any effect, and this is what you observe. However, there are these uh, oscillations, uh, which uh, to some extent increase uh, in time or increase change in the polarization. This is something I didn't get. Because of course, they, they depend on the difference in energy, right? And this is exactly the energy difference between the two lasers, but then it shouldn't change with polarization, right? 
Yes, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, the thing is that uh, I have no way to control the, uh, how the lasers drift to with respect okay. to... Okay, so this is time. So you, you are yes. making the experiment starting from zero increasing. Yes. And exactly. in time, you have a bigger and bigger uh, splitting. Okay, sure. Yes, yes. Now, um, so, but at, at time zero, let's say, you shouldn't have any splitting, right? Uh, but, and anyway, you can try to do an experiment in which at time zero, you don't have any splitting between the two lasers. Uh, uh, so, because this is a statistical, uh, so this is me measured with the, the TCSPC electronics and you acquire the statistics for some time, uh, the experiment, uh, experiment has some length in time. Of course, I can measure it for one minute. Okay, so sure. So is, maybe this is limiting your, uh, uh, your your size of the uh, of the of, of the deep. So the, my 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 question is: when when the, the energy difference is zero, what is giving this the, the, the size of the Hongo Mendel? Is it the coherent the, the, the yes yes it the is coherence of the two lasers? From from my understanding, it is a relative yes. Uh, relative in the two lasers, yes. Okay, so if this is the case, then I suppose for a condensate, you should have a depth which depends on the coherence of the condensate, right? Yes. But in fact, at time zero, you don't see that. Okay. Yes, so this you, is. You uh, said this is what it was surprising. Could you explain to me this? Uh, Sure, sure, of course. So uh, you're referring to this, right? Basically, this map mm -hmm. here uh, uh, represents the um, uh, the amplitude of the Hongo Mandel effect with respect to optical delay. And uh, uh, what I say is that if we move from the zero time delay for this system, in which our uh, G1 uh, is the highest uh, and fringe visibility is the highest, out we start to see the um, start to see this Hongo Mandel deep, and actually this is a very uh, great question. And of course we asked this ourselves. We at this point do not have the exact uh, answer to it because, as you rightfully said, and as I rightfully understand, for the lasers, and it was shown in the works um, uh, who of people who were doing this dealing with the laser, um, the the perfect condition uh, when the co the lasers are matched uh, perfectly uh, it is uh, this work for example the second work here uh, this is one, one laser this is one single mode very tight uh, line beads laser and they put it through basically it interferes the hongo mandel effect it happens with itself and to observe the effect they use um, a phase modulator in one of the arms, basically breaking the phase between the two arms, making it the, bringing uncertainty in the system. And you can see on the panel uh, on the right, uh, as the uncertainty is zero, uh, there is no noise in the system. They show that the Hongo Mandel effect is actually so broad, it's a black line here, so broad that. Uh, it's not appearing here, and as they start to increase the noise within the system bringing uh, more noise, the Hongo Mandel effect the, uh, starts to narrow and... Sure, but this, this is because the laser is more coherent than 300 yes. nanoseconds, right? And uh, in, the, in, in our experiment, we also expect if the condensate performs like a laser uh, to have this picture inverted. So we should have a sort of broad uh, Hongo Mandel effect in the middle, and then it should narrow to some point. So this is some, some picture that we expect, but uh, this is not the case how it is done. Now we are in this discussion with the theoreticians and try to analyze and understand why this is happening. But at this point, uh, I cannot give you a strict answer, uh, dependent on the literature that I read with the lasers, it should be different, but this is uh, all wholeheartedly what I have. Okay, um, so maybe I finish my 10 minutes, I'm not sure. Do we want to do a, to a tour of questions before going on or? Yes, uh, please, please, Daniel, if you have one more question, no problem. 
Well, okay, so keeping this, this uh, subject may, maybe it's kind of short because I would like to know what is the information you gain from this uh, classical Hongu Mendel that you don't get with the standard G2, for instance? Um, the information <laughs> gain, you say. Well, let's say in your motivation, you were saying that you wanted to yeah. see if uh, uh, the uh, polarization was mm -hmm. uh, really mm -hmm. random or not, but this can be done by single shot me measurement, right? Uh, so uh, the th the s several uh, things that we wanted to check is, oh, first of all, uh, whether the condensate due to its uh, uh, different nature of emission from the laser, whether it will be comparable in this sense, in the Hongo Mandel sense, what was known from, from, for, for, for the lasers, basically. So we were expecting to have a, a dip of 0 0.5. Uh, the question uh, outside of where this dip happens uh, with respect to optical delay line position, but we were expecting to have it uh, at, uh, values close to the visibility close to 40 percent 50 percent maybe yeah? and uh, i want to uh, once again say that actually this experiment took a long time for me to conduct due to the fact that i was expecting to see the 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 deep in the in the zero time delay but it was not there it was a coincidence um, that i found it elsewhere however mm, uh, however the idea and the thought that uh, we got from this uh, measurement and we try to explain uh, how this uh, deep visibility which we get um, is different from the single mode laser so the, we have only visibility of uh, 17 percent and the laser is almost 50 is maybe due to condensate is actually having some uh, some maybe peculiar spatial profile and it might might be have some um, different different numbers or some fragmentation happening within the system uh, which can cause this because all other matters you are, you are integrating in space right I'm integrating in space exactly so if you imagine uh, like thought experiment if you have a, a source which uh, randomly switches in spatial mode from TM00 say to TM01 you will have different amount of light coming into the system uh, and uh, TM00 will couple perfectly but TM01 due to real space imaging into the fiber will couple very little and if you run the experiment and there's some switching between the modes and they delay it with respect to each other there is no it's not in zero time delay when they're TM00 coming from the both sides or TM01 from the both sides, but they're decoupled from each other, you will see that uh, the, 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 the correlation function will change actually. Mm -hmm. So depending on the number of photon entering from one on the other side. So this is something that we are thinking about right now, uh, but uh, we need to confirm it with the, some modeling. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Simone. Let's move to your slot. Yes. Uh, well, I start by saying thank you for the very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, I learned a few things and also for the, for the manuscript. Um, I would like to ask some questions about, especially about the, the, um, the first part, the one on the carbon chains. Uh, can you start by a uh, general explanation? Can you explain a bit uh, uh, what the, the electronic excitations look like in those systems? So I see the peaks, but what are those peaks? Um, so um, uh, I would say that, um, first of all, I would say that um, the work to simulate the system uh, was very tough for the people who did the simulation and they had to come up with a very very elaborate uh, theoretical model to explain what is happening in the system exactly and uh, from my perspective as an experimentalist i got this uh, spectral characteristics and this fine structure when i saw the spectrums um, 
I can say the following. So there is, we excite an exiton, uh, exiton by, uh, in my understanding, transition, transiting the electron from the uh, molecular orbital to some higher value, which, and which it, when it, when it, um, through the band gap, and when it uh, goes down, uh, come back to some relaxed state, we have uh, the emission of the photon, uh, uh, which constitutes uh, this uh, spectral picture, while uh, for the different lengths of the chains, you have different band gaps, which are indicated in this, uh, uh, well, let's say, semi-discrete lines. In the system, you have uh, many of, uh, uh, of uh, carbon, uh, carbon things, not only the singular monochains, of course, uh, because although they made, uh, 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 tried to try the hard to basically have uh, most of the uh, uh, sample being uh, monochains oriented in some particular direction, however, there will still a lot of uh, other um, filament. Um, Fuller ends and other stuff, which also contributed to the overall uh, emission spectrum here. So, uh, the things that uh, constitute most, uh, I guess, it is this uh, uh, transition from the highest orbital molecular state to the lowest through the band gap. And yes. Okay. Uh, and these, which is the largest number, I mean, we see very nice replicas of uh, the uh, of the resonance uh, uh, mm -hmm. up to which number have they been observed uh, these resonances were present for all the chains all the chains however uh, uh, from what i can recall is that uh, depending on the point on the sample the spectrum uh, changed quite a bit. Uh, you can probably see it in the um, in here. Yeah, this is uh, on inset. This is the yeah. po different points in the sample. And you can see that general general um, insets do change due to we excite uh, a different different amount of chains of different lengths, right? And for this particular picture on the B. Uh, the most pronounced uh, excitation and zoomed in excitation was found to be for 10, 12, and 14. However, uh, the, the effect was seen for other chains as well, uh, for, for the other part of the spectrum as well. Okay, thank you. Can you go to the, to the following slide, please? Yes. Uh, about uh, the, uh, the two figures on the left, uh, could, we, uh, could you please explain a bit uh, not only the change in decay, but the actual uh, different uh, different dependency. The, we have one exponential and one non-exponential decay uh -huh. uh, changing the temperature. Can you explain yes. the discussion on what's changing physically? Yes. Um, in my understanding, um, once again, this is uh, uh, the, the, the where we take the data from varies depending on the um, on the 300 Kelvin or 4 Kelvin uh, because there is some shift in the crystal, but it should not matter actually because physically, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, for the uh, decay curves which were measured um, measured uh, at room temperature, there is an additional. Uh, there is an additional energy relaxation channel, which was described as a as the uh, carrier transition from one chain, the electron transition from one chain from exciton from one chain uh, to some neighboring chains, because because they are in a very uh, close proximity to each other. So these chains are located very close to each other, and there is uh, some hopping of the electron between the chains, which is non-radiative. And uh, uh, this actually results in this change of uh, the, exponent, uh, the, the shape of the decay curves. Okay, uh, can you maybe link a bit more with the specific shape of the curves in panel A and C? 
because uh, I see uh, in the lowest one uh, an exponential decay and then with a, with a single with a single exponential time. In the upper one, I see two of them. I see a transition between a faster decay for shorter time scales to a slower mm -hmm. one for longer ones. Can you link this uh, uh, with this functional dependency with the model that you just described, please? Is, is, is the question clear? Yes, yes, I understand the question. So uh, your question is basically why uh, this non-radiative uh, carrier hopping, if it is one, in, if it is there, uh, affect the uh, the shape of the decay curve. Basically, in room temperature, it's not being mono uh, exponential, or rather, being like several, uh, double actually exponential. Yes. Um, the times become longer uh, here you can see for sure um, I just try to recall. I, I just try to I imagine um, if there were no this thermal hopping of the carrier, which was described in the model, um, whether the the decay curves would be just just longer. Just time will be longer. You are adding a new loss channel with a different uh, increase in the temperature. You are opening novel channels and scattering channels from which you get the, the sort of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's move forward. Uh, there was not a minute to be done. Uh, one last question about the pinning. At some yes. point, you show the pinning of the polarization uh, due. To uh, there is another figure in which you show the um, the profile uh, on the on the sphere. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain a bit better the microscopic origin of this pinning? Um, so, so the uh, uh, when the cavity is deposited here, uh, well, when when the cavity was created. Uh, it consists of several layers uh, with different uh, uh, crystalline structure. And uh, although the efforts were made to match the layers with uh, adding some, as I recall, uh, buffer layers which match the crystalline uh, structure more better, uh, still uh, the, through the deposition, uh, of the sample, some uh, mechanical strain, of course, uh, remains within the system. And that mechanical strain is, uh, is, the, is, is the cause for uh, a biofringence uh, occurring, biofringent effect occurring in the system. And with this, uh, the, uh, the one mode over the other uh, in the uh, uh, linear polarized mode here, uh, uh, starts to receive more gain. Uh, and uh, in, the, in this trap, in the ground state of the trap, you will, uh, uh, the, the, the condensate splits with the more uh, uh, gain for one mode rather than for the other modes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I'm done. Uh, I have a formal question about: uh, Do you satisfy, yes. satisfied with this? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm satisfied with the changes made in the manuscript. Great. And uh, Daniel, 
I forgot to ask you, you also satisfied. Yes, yeah, sure, I read it and, in, and satisfied too. No problem. Thank you very much. Then let's switch to the part of the jury. Okay. Mitri, okay. you're welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to ask uh, questions to, uh, related to the slide number seven. And uh, it is my favorite part of this uh, PhD thesis. I'm sorry, I have asked many questions and uh, um, also I have uh, obtained a good answer on this one. But um, uh, in this case, we used uh, two types of gold nanoparticles, here yeah, 10 and 100 nanometers. And could you explain this choice? Yeah. So, um... Um, I'm not exactly the person who uh, asked, uh, but uh, from my understanding, these nanoparticles, uh, first of all, uh, they were very, um, uh, very much useful to orient the, um, the chains. So on the picture B, actually, here you cannot see the gold nanoparticles. And I recall it was the question. And actually, there, there are images in the, in, the, uh, in, in the papers where you can see them, but I choose this one just to clear. It is just out of the, of the picture. The gold nanoparticles uh, are, in principle, used to uh, anchor and orient the carbon uh, uh, monochains. Uh, as well as it came out to provide this, uh, as was dis described, uh, additional carriers to basically add this uh, uh, effect of uh, fine splitting of the spectrum, which you can see in the panel B. However, uh, the, uh, the difference in the size, which was uh, important here, uh, I guess, is, due, is, is for uh, the orientation. Of the of the system in some uh, or oriented to the electrical field which was applied to the system, and this is uh, why uh, uh, they used these two sizes. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm not sure how it is difficult to cre create. I know that there is methods to create the nanoparticles of sizes from 10 to 100, and it's quite an old technique actually. I I, I had to look up uh, some papers on it and it's like 60s so I guess now it's more easier to do and exact method they used I'm not sure of but probably it is some common uh, common way to create some mm -hmm. these particles yes and they're used to orient the chains within the system mm -hmm. and also you used uh, wavelengths less than uh, 400 nanometers but in case of uh, presence of gold nanoparticles uh, I suppose that uh, because you have 10 up to 100 nanometers, the maximum of extinction of gold nanoparticles is close to 500 Sochi. What, what do you think? If you will try irradiate together this uh, less than 400 and the same time 100 Sochi too, what, the, uh, what do you expect from this one? Um, I'm uh, personally very interested in the uh, continuation of uh, this uh, research because I've done it uh, in the beginning of my PhD and uh, I, I kind of feel that there is a lot uh, still to be measured here um, and probably it is a very in interesting experiment to do. Uh, the thing is that the absorption spectrum of these uh, carbon chains is actually studied and uh, it is uh, sort of uh, far uh, from where we we were exciting them and it is more in the uv range uh, and it was hard to achieve with our equipment at that point uh, so we did what we could um, however uh, now it might be interesting to actually look at the excitation in the absorption spectra and the excitation into more uh, uh, better lines where they absorb and actually the experiment you suggested and also uh, with this, uh, with the, uh, I would add, uh, with the knowledge that I have, with the correlations, with the density correlations, with some different light sources, with different photon statistics, it would be interesting to come back with the expertise and actually try to measure the, the, the second order coherence function of these uh, structures because they were meant to uh, be uh, like a single photon source, if you 
kind of separate one chain, probably it can emit a singular transition, do a single transition and emit a single photon, which uh, would be interesting to check, but... Uh, thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for your answer on the my comments and question, I satisfied. Thank you very much, Dmitry Sekularis. Now it's your turn. <clears throat> Thanks for the very, very nice presentation. And um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions uh, regarding... Uh, I'm going back to this uh, um, uh, Simone's question about uh, the, this um, um, pinning of the polarization because of the birefringence you, you mentioned, right? So uh, my question is, uh, can, can you neutralize this effect by uh, sampling a different size, for example, ch changing the size of your uh, condensate? And uh, what, what is the range of this uh, um, uh, birefringence effect that you have in your sample? Thank you very much for a uh, very good, good and practical question, because uh, through, the, through the research, uh, we kind of got uh, many ways to uh, manipulate the photon statistics of light which we which we observe and one of them as i mentioned is not only by uh, manipulating the place on the sample where the biofringent is present biofringent is present but we don't know well we will it be there next time we warm up and uh, cool down the sample however uh, for example here you can see that uh, on the middle panel, uh, the, the, the photon statistics is bunched uh, and uh, the trap with which we excite this uh, part of the sample is uh, symmetrically circular. However, if we start tuning, the, making the trap elliptical, it's schematic here, but it's just a very small ellipticity added to the, to the pump profile. The schematic here just to represent it better, uh, but by adding uh, this asymmetry in the trap, we can actually tune the photon statistics and actually negate uh, the effect of the pinning within the system by adding uh, opposite uh, asymmetry, basically. That's probably the answer to your question. We can, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Stepan, thank you very much for your presentations, for all your questions. I have just one, uh, maybe general question, because uh, Humber Brown and this experiment, uh, as I thought, and uh, it is a sort of quantum effect uh, that was originally proposed, yeah? And in your case, you measure something where you have a lot of uh, photons, if I understood correctly, yeah? So what is the relation between these two realizations, or maybe, I don't know, viewpoints of the effect. Um, you started from the picture about two single photons, if I understand correctly, interfering on the mirror and... Uh, you probably refer to Hongo Mandel experiment, not Humphrey Brown. Ah, Chris. maybe. So. Yes. So uh, the Hongo Mandel effect mm -hmm. for uh, a source which emits two photons, it was uh, firstly shown in the case of spontaneous down conversion when they saw uh, uh, two photons emitted and they were uh, entangled but sometimes uh, entangled and uh, identical but uh, with, there are different types of spontaneous down conversion emission and uh, from uh, the polarization might not match but the times when the polarization matched uh, the the effect was uh, up to very high visibility, basically. And it's indeed a, a quantum effect. It's uh, described in the quantum uh, sense. Uh, however, mm, it's uh, still uh, some property, right, which can describe the, uh, uh, the classical source too, mm -hmm. as was shown for the case of the lasers. And people shown that for the lasers, it is... Um, as it is, this visibility of 0 0.5. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, um, in my opinion, it is as, as robust characteristic as a, a G2 of uh, 1 for the coherent light source. Mm -hmm. um, 
as visibility of Hongo bundle effect for the light sources of 0 0.5. So this is one, once again, a nice characteristics to refer to when comparing light sources. Now, uh, for the condensates, we wanted to see, um, actually, the, the initial idea, the initial idea was to uh, determine the, uh, this indistinguishability of photons in the regime when uh, the condensate emits as we see unpolarized lights. So in we do integrated measurements, the lights appear to be unpolarized. And uh, from that thought, uh, we tried to, uh, we said like, okay, now let's uh, look at the Hongo Mandel effect at that regime. Uh, what will it tell us? If the polarization is uh, determined, it's some, particular orientation at the given point of time. Uh, however, it rapidly switches. If we locally measure the Hongo Mandel effect at zero time delay due to matching of the polarization degree of uh, indistinguishability, we will get a, a Hongo Mandel effect of visibility 0 0.5, which you would expect from the laser and for the condensate as we were expecting actually. Mm -hmm. However, if the condensate uh, in this regime of DOP degree of polarization close to zero is actually emitting uh, light with different kind of polarization all, of, all the time, uh, in that case, we will not see the deep in the zero time delay, the Hongo Mandel scheme due to uh, at any given point of time, there is a probability of different, uh, differently polarized pola uh, photons entering into the system and basically getting absorbed by the polarizers. And that was something, uh, th this was the tool, the effect and the tool to, to, to answer this question of DOP, degree of polarization close to zero, Thank in our case. Thank you very much. Okay, dear colleagues, uh, I'm perfectly satisfied with the answers. What about you? Do we need the second round of questions from the jury members? Well, no. I hope so. Now questions from the audience, if there are any. Yes, please. Uh, Stepan, do you expect any difference in uh, home measurements for trapped condensate mm -hmm. and freely expanding condensate? It is... Um... It is a very good question, and actually, I, uh, I had to look uh, already. I had a look, and actually, I couldn't see. Um, ah, actually, I looked uh, when I pumped with uh, this linearly polarized light, but it's better to look at the circularly polarized light. However, um, the 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 the, the uh, dynamics of the Hongo Mandel effect is, sh should be dictated by the coherence time and uh, the slope is basically the coherence time uh, dictated by the coherence time of our light source and uh, from that sense uh, maybe the picture uh, which was measured for the Hongo Mandel effect measured for the traps of different sizes maybe representative at some, at some, at some degree uh, when we tightened the trap, the decay of the uh, deep became faster. And uh, in my mind and in the discussion, it's probably due to higher overlap of uh, condensate with the reservoir, which de decoherence it and, uh, at this point already. And this is probably if you uh, create a condensate with Gaussian and it's purely overlapped with the excitonic reservoir on top of which it's created, we might not be able to see the Hongo Mandel effect with the setup that we have. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, can I have one more question? Sure oh, one. Short one. Uh, slide number 20. Uh, you have some spots which are experimental and uh, uh, I think there were solid lines as well. Here. Yeah, this, this one, mm -hmm. yeah, 19. Uh, is it the theory versus experiment? Yes, this is the theory versus experiment. And, uh, why yeah. do you see this difference? Discrepancy. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it is a very good question. This is the question more to the theory, I guess, and you probably can notice <laughs> the very big uh, discrepancy which is happening at the round threshold, right? Uh, the theory starts to from the value of two and the experiment has actually started from the value of almost one. Uh, this is something that nobody asked, but uh, it is known to the people who do these uh, G2 measurements and we were asked by the jury, but the, the, the discrepancy in the later parts of the power, uh, power is due to uh, the model not accounting for uh, for a slight ellipticity which is present into the system uh, which will cause uh, a correlation function um, to perform actually uh, like this yeah so if you have slight ellipticity your your uh, g2 at zero time delay will decrease after, after after a while due to imprinting some imbalance into the system and here it's not accounted for in the theory however if we, you account for it uh, the theory uh, theoretical curves black at least starts to go down slightly if you add uh, like uh, just a little bit of uh, ellipticity into the system there is some such a comparison of the thesis if you want you can look it up uh, you, i can show you um uh, and this is the this is the explanation yes okay. thank you very much Other any okay yeah uh, can i have a short question so mm -hmm. Stefan, can i go to slide 23 and I wonder for the, <clears throat> this precession, uh, you present here the polarization component, but I wonder what was the G2 of total emission intensity? Was it flat or was it also oscillated in time? Uh, it was flat. Um, so, um, independent on the point on the sample and that independently on the biofringence, if I recall correctly, uh, if we excite condensate above threshold, if there is no any other um, errors, uh, the condensate as it is remained, remained uh, like a plateau. So the total system. intensity was steady? Was yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, it was some short noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Clear answer, clear question. Are there any other beautiful questions? Then let us switch to the supervisors who now have their own time. And let's start from Paulus and after that Anton. Okay. Okay. So, well, thank you very much, everyone, again. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, also Stepan coming to uh, present the work of uh, his very exploratory PhD. Uh, as you will have seen, Stepan has taken on uh, a route which is out of the regular polaritonics work that we have been doing. He has been uh, given uh, tasks again together with uh, Anton Zasedatelev, uh, co supervised with Anton Zasedatelev, to, to explore really both uh, quantum correlations and photon correlations in the quantum regime for uh, polaritonics. Uh, there are a lot of questions which uh, remain uh, unanswered, but really with, uh, with the latest work that Anton has done, he is really opening for us new research. So, uh, I articulate for him because he really took a very ambitious uh, project on, with, uh, which is associated with a very big risk. And uh, he did uh, an extremely good uh, job very high impact papers came out and the work that he has started uh, i'm confident that uh, we will follow on this and try to see where we are getting on with this higher order quantum correlations uh, in, uh, in in polaritonics so stepan thank you very much and it has been a great pleasure to see you really develop and come to the stage where you are now almost a doctor in the group for the next few minutes, I guess. Okay, thank, thank you. you Paul. Anton, the floor is yours. Yes, Anton, welcome. <clears throat> can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> also, first of all, I would like to thank everybody 
uh, all the referees for being uh, thorough and for uh, your deep and insightful comments. Uh, and that improves the quality of the Stepan speech thesis. I remember, I think it was back in June, right, Stepan, if I'm not, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, when I get the first draft uh, and uh, now when I read it this week, I, I see quite a, quite a difference. Because actually now Stepan did a great job, significantly improved the thesis, I think. Uh, currently, it's actually a coherent story, I believe, consistent of relevant introduction, motivation, outlining the gaps of the knowledge, as Paolo stressed out also, it's a new or chartered territory in Polaritonics to some extent. <clears throat> also, uh, state-of-the-art methodologies in there, very well described, by the way. And uh, of course, comprehensive analysis, including theory from Helgi Sigurdsson, uh, gives his contribution to the, to the project as well, followed by discussions, overview, and uh, what I found very um, valuable for the community and uh, for, for, yeah, for, for, for him, uh, for, for Stepan, first of all, is that he provided now the original perspective, his author original perspective for the future research in this field. This is, I think it was, it has been stressed out also by referees and it's, it's now within the PhD thesis as well. And this is great. Uh, maybe I would say a couple of words uh, finally about, uh, to, to, to wrap up about uh, Stefan as the, as the candidate for doctoral degrees. Uh, he's actually a well-trained guy, uh, well-trained uh, young scientist, skilled, uh, patient. Uh, he's I mean, capable for critical thinking and analysis, he uh, spotted many uh, mistakes uh, we had uh, on the way um, in this research. He took, uh, yeah, actually, he took a lead at some point in, in, in this in this research, and he is now um, self-organized um, and um, can can proceed with these um, investigations on his own, basically. And that's what, what he is actually uh, demonstrated during the talk as well. Uh, but equally important than what makes him a little bit different from some other students maybe which I work with um, during my um, postdoc period, uh, he is actually a very hardworking guy, uh, at times maybe even too much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he is one of those who actually have a patient to the fundamental research, and I think this is a uh, very essential traits uh, to make a career in uh, in academia. Uh, so, I, without any doubts, I recommend Stepan for his PhD degree, and uh, yeah, wish him all the best. That's that's basically it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. And now we switch to the deliberation procedure. And let's follow the instructions of. Uh, Yelena. So the, the instructions will be actually very much the same. Uh, we will now open a separate breakout room for the jury members who attend online. Meanwhile, we ask uh, Stepan uh, and all uh, the audience, all the guests of the defense who attend here in person to, to leave the room. Uh, and the audience attending online, you can just stay online with us and wait for the announcement of, of the results. Okay, Stepan, please come here. Okay, dear colleagues, we worked very hard and very long, and after strong discussion, we come to the decision that the thesis can be accepted as is, and from now on, Stepan Barashev is a PhD of Skoltech. Please. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad that uh, I come to this point, but uh, I hope, I hope, and uh, I'm almost 100% sure that this is only the beginning. And uh, although the road to, to this point was quite difficult, but the difficulties are still ahead, and I hope uh, that my scientific work will impact the world at some point, and uh, I continue work uh, in the academia or somewhere else in the scientific field. Uh, and I want to thank uh, everyone. I want to thank um, my parents and uh, uh, everyone and my group 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm just emotional. Um, I want to thank uh, Pavlos for uh, letting me do this and uh, Anton who taught me a lot. I want to thank uh, Tamsin who helped me with the thesis and every guy in the lab who helped me go, <laughs> go through this. Thank you.